has come to wipe our tears away. Even now the throne to welcome him. Prepare, join all and sing. Hosanna, Hosanna, thank Mark. Blessed he is he who comes, bringing salvation this morning. Will you join me in the call to worship? We come to prepare for the holiest of weeks. Jesus leads us through this week, and we will follow, for he is the life we long for. He is the word who sustains us. We 
setting aside all power, glory, and might, he comes, modeling humility and obedience for all of us. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes to the kingdom of God. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Lord, we shout Hosanna this morning in thanksgiving for your sacrifice to come. Lord, we thank you for saving us and for giving us gifts and graces to do your will here on this earth. We ask you to consecrate this service, Lord. Bring us the word that we will need to get through this difficult week as we head toward Resurrection Sunday. Lord, we thank you and we praise you and we bless your holy name on this Palm Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.
Amen. He is my everything. Do you feel that in your spirit today, St. Mark? Do you feel that, St. Mark? So good morning. Good morning, St. Mark. It's a beautiful day. The sun is shining. There might be that little nip in the air, but that lets us know that we are alive. Amen? And we live in Chicago, so this is what we know to expect. Good morning and welcome. I'm Andrea Clerk. I'm here to share a few key news items, and I welcome you on behalf of our senior pastor, the Reverend Peter Von Brown, the clergy, the leaders of St. Mark. Whether you are here in the building with us or worshiping with us virtually, good morning. There are so many things that we need to share as we work our way into this week, but let me go ahead and start with the fact that, of course, Friday is Good Friday. The March 29th, we will be hosting a presentation of the seven last words and a lineup of all of the wonderful preachers who are going to be with us on Friday is in the bulletin, so please take a look. Next Sunday is, of course, Easter Sunday. There will be two services. Our sunrise service will be at 7 a.m., and then our 10 a.m. service will include the Sunday school program. And, of course, in between, there will be the opportunity for breakfast, thank you, thank you, to the United Methodist Men for once again coming into the breach and taking care and providing that meal. So we look forward to seeing all of you with your family, your friends, come out and join us next week. There is still the opportunity to donate for Easter baskets for our residents at the St. Mark Manor. We're hoping to fill 60 baskets, so their donations will still be collected in McFarland Parlor today. If you have additional donations, additional questions, please contact Rose Faulkner, and her phone number is listed in the bulletin. We also want to call out that we will be hosting an expungement clinic, and those details are listed in the bulletin as well. That is coming up, so please, if you know of anyone who is need of, need of those services, please reach out and support. Just as the Lord forgives us, let us help the state to find additional ways to forgive and support those who have done their time. So with that said, let us turn to celebrations. Do we have anyone celebrating a birthday today or in the next six days? Just wave your hand, let us know. Happy birthday, I see a hand in the back there. I can't quite see who that is, but happy birthday. Anybody else, anybody? If you are worshiping with us virtually, please drop that on into the chat so that we can celebrate with you. And do we have any lovebirds celebrating an anniversary? Anyone? Anyone? No anniversaries? That's okay. And are we so blessed to have any first-time visitors with us today? We won't make you do anything, quote your favorite Bible verses they used to do at my church home in New Jersey. But if anyone is visiting with us for the first time, please let us know. Well, like I say all the time, that's our assignment for next week. Easter's the Super Bowl of the year, so bring in a visitor with you. So I will turn this over to the pastors to continue our service. And welcome and have a wonderful, wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. another good morning to you. We are just so thankful to be here in the house of the Lord today. I'm bringing a scripture lesson, and our scripture today is uh, from the gospel according to Mark, in chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. And this, it is a gospel lesson, so will you please stand, if you are able, to receive this gospel message. That is Mark Chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Hear the word. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a coat tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it. 
and we'll send it back here shortly. Well, they went and found a coat outside in the street, tied at a doorpost. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that coat? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and people let them go. When they brought the coat to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread the branches that they had cut in the field. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of God for the people of God. Hear the word of God.
Lord has our praise. Let us pray. God, we thank you for everything that you've created. For God, you've given us reasons to praise you. We praise you for the beauty of this day. We praise you for your spirit, which is here with us now. Most of all, God, this morning, we praise you for your son, Jesus, who is the Christ, whose blood washes away our sins. Now, God, if you would be with me, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We do have a lot to praise God about, don't we? Amen. If you got something to be grateful for, let the Lord know. Thank you. Thank you, God, for another day on this side of glory. Here it is, Palm Sunday, in the midst of Women's History Month, as we're continuing our Black History Month from February, Palm Sunday, Women's History. Black women history. We have a lot to commemorate and a lot to celebrate on this very morning. Not to mention the fact that God's mercy and grace have allowed us to see the splendor of another day. Yes, yes. Now, now I've preached over 30, probably over 35 Palm Sundays <laughs> using this same text. Each Palm Sunday. So you can imagine the challenge of keeping it fresh, thank you, fresh each year. Uh, yet inevitably, when Palm Sunday rolls around, God somehow gives me a little something different than what I preached the year before or the years before. And if God didn't, it probably wouldn't make much difference because y'all don't remember what I preached about it last year, do you? But that's a whole nother story. Anyhow, this story details the week before Christ died on the cross at Calvary. Now, there are a number of noteworthy points concerning his journey through Jerusalem and route to Good Friday. So I'll use one of my many, many childhood experiences as a means of introducing what I would consider the first fresh point this year. You see, like some of you, my childhood menu of favorite television shows included westerns, amen, had the cap gun, had the cowboy hat, I think at one point I even had some cowboy boots. <laughs> westerns were just one of the TV shows or movies that we watched as children, and many of those westerns included scenes that took place on farms or ranches. Some of those farms and ranches involved fence corrals that uh, macho men would try to train horses, wild horses in. You know those scenes, don't you? Huh? The man, usually the man, sometimes it was a woman, usually a man would get in that corral with a wild horse and hop on top of it, and what would the horse do? Try to buck it off, right? And he'd keep doing it and keep doing it over and over and over again until the animal finally handled as smooth as a fully equipped Cadillac Broham. It, yeah, once the animal chilled out, everything was good. Well, one of the, in my opinion, undismissible features of Jesus' journey into Jerusalem was when he ordered his boys his boys to go ahead of him and retrieve a colt that he could ride into town on. Now, the open and obvious reason Jesus sent them to get that colt was what? For the purpose of fulfilling prophecy that predicted Israel's messianic king would one day arrive on a colt in that fashion. Thus, Jesus was letting everybody know that he was indeed the anointed one, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So from a theological perspective, this whole riding in humbly on a cult thing was meant to reveal his identity as the long-awaited Messiah. 
But like I always try to remind our members, there's usually at least two ways to interpret biblical narratives. There's the theological angle, which I just talked about, Jesus, the Messiah, fulfilling Old Testament scripture. And there's what I call the practical angle, the practical angle. I mean, whenever I watched Westerns, it was no joke when a cowboy hopped atop an unbroken horse. That animal would do everything, absolutely everything in its power to send the rider into orbit around the moon. That's the horse's, that's the animal's objective. Most untrained animals, period, don't want humans riding on them, do they? Yet in today's story, Jesus tells his boys to borrow an animal that had never been ridden on, never ever been written, never been broken with the only collateral being a promise that God needed the animal and that it would be what returned. I mean, did you catch, do you see, can you sense where I'm going with this? Do you, do you see a practical application here? Probably not. That's all right. I'm going to tell you about it right now. Huh? Each of us, each of you possess gifts. We all have talents. We all possess resources under our immediate control. Sometimes those talents are being used, but not to their full potential, while in other instances they're tied to a post and not being used at all. God has given each of us gifts for the specific purpose of glorifying God and helping to build his reign on earth as it is in heaven. Whether or not you realize it, the Lord is daily beckoning you to put your gifts, to put those gifts God gave you, to put the gifts to work sooner rather than later. I mean, just because you're like me and you're not a soloist doesn't mean you shouldn't sing in a choir. If you can hold a note or come close to it, we need you. God needs you. God wants you. Yeah, untie that coat, tie it to the pole. Just because you aren't a pastor doesn't mean you shouldn't preach through your service to others. Untie your gifts, untie that coat. Just because you aren't a parent doesn't mean you shouldn't mentor or tutor a young person. Untie the coat, untie the gifts that are tied to the poles. God wants to employ every resource that you and I possess towards making the world a better place. The question is, are you willing to untie your gifts for use by the creator, the Savior? The owner of the coat was willing to do that. And notice what he got out of it. You see, there's, from what I've read, no evidence whatsoever that this never ridden coat attempted to buck Jesus into orbit once he hopped on top of it. I, I mean, it could have happened, but I would think that would be noted somewhere in the scripture if a donkey had the nerve to buck Jesus off of him, right? But there's no evidence to suggest that that animal, that coat, that donkey, that foal, whatever you want to call it, did anything to get rid of Jesus once he set on it, which suggests to me that when the animal was returned to its owner, it was no longer unridden, it was no longer unbroken, it was no longer a beast of burden, but was now broken and tuned up to handle with, you know, I like cars, handle like a Porsche Turbo Carrera careening down the German Autobahn. That animal had somehow changed. The colt was now more useful and more valuable after being used by Jesus than before being called into service. You see the practical angle there? You see, you see where I'm going? The angle is that when you let the Lord use you and your resources and your gifts to his glory, 
God doesn't deplete them. He increases them. God doesn't deplete them. He enhances them. He intensifies them. He amplifies them. He enriches them. The Lord makes them better. Indeed, when you give yourself to the Lord, God makes you better. He doesn't deplete you. He makes you stronger. He makes you wiser. He makes you better. All you got to do is let him use you. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, Jesus sat on it. I thought that was kind of a unique spin on it, don't you think? Have you heard that one before? Yeah, no. Oh, I thought, yeah. Fresh. <laughs> At 35 years. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Well, let me try another one. Another fresh point in the story can be extracted from what happened after Jesus boarded the donkey. As some of you know, um, last summer, Sharon and I went on a sabbatical. I guess it was my sabbatical, right? Well, <laughs> so, so we went on a sabbatical, and part of our sabbatical included a trip to Gay Patty. If you're a Facebook follower, you saw some of her 10,000 pictures of the Eiffel Tower. But we won't go there right now because she's in the house and I'm going to be nice. Or it's too late and I've already done the damage, so I might as well just keep on going. Huh? Anyways, <clears throat> we went to Paris. And while there, we booked a guided walking tour of black history in the city. Anyone ever done that tour in Paris? Yeah, owned by a black company, a black woman. And it was interesting hearing her tell the stories about persons like James Baldwin and Josephine Baker and Richard Wright, who lived significant portions of their lives in Paris during the 40s to escape what? Racism here in the United States. And it was also neat to learn some lesser known history, including the fact that the Arc the Triumph. Sound, sound legit, right? I got a little French in me. The, the Arc the Triomphe, which is a memorial to those who fought and died for France in war, contains the names of Toussaint L'Overture, right? Jean-Jacques de Saligny. I don't know if I said that right, but you get my point. Two black men on the Arc of the Triomphe. Two black men who were instrumental in the liberation of Haiti from France. We know what's going on in Haiti now. But th these brothers broke free of France's control, and they are listed in France's history. I mean, this was a wonderful tour, Sharon and I. We could have, she could have, if you know her, she could have organized that kind of tour on her own. But it was made a whole lot easier by employing the services of a tour guide. We, we took a tour of the museum, but we had a tour guide to help direct us where we wanted to go, right? It was made easier by the employ of the services of a tour guide who shared interesting tidbits of information we would otherwise have never heard. Uh, a tour guide who kept us together with these little headphones, right? So the tour guide could be way up there, but we could still hear what she was saying over the noises of the big city. It never hurts to follow a person who can lead and guide you along this life's journey, especially when you're not sure about where you're going or what it takes to get there. I mean, the, the theological meaning behind Jesus riding a donkey is important. It was to fulfill prophecy. But how he, how Jesus dealt with the journey to Jerusalem and on to Calvary has practical implications and applications. I mean, here Jesus is, surrounded by a bunch of adoring fans. Fans who lay out the green carpet for him and address him as that guy, 
that guy who could and would save them, Hosanna. They laid out the green carpet, yet, yet he doesn't let it go to his head. I mean, I know people who've developed large, expanded, expansive craniums with a lot less attention than he got. It would have been easy for Jesus to set up his own 501c3 right there on the spot and begin his own mega church. Huh? Oh, I got all these folk following me. Let me just stop, plant right here, put out my hand and build a church. But he didn't. He didn't know exactly what those folks were going to do, but he wasn't going to let them stop him from his appointed task. <sighs> Could have accumulated a whole bunch of wealth and fame and fortune in different ways. He could have, he could have stopped and wrote a couple of books. Uh, he could have stayed right there. But he continued on his journey up the king's highway. When Jesus reached the temple, he could have hung out in the courtyard, put on a couple of revivals, right? Done a little church growth consulting. <laughs> he, could have, he could have stopped after that, laid in the cut for retirement. Instead, he did something. Some house cleaning, if you know the story. He, he did some house cleaning. He kicked out those robbers in the den. He stayed on task. When his adoring fans bailed on him by giving Pontius Pilate a green light to pull the switch, Jesus could have said, bump y'all. Right? He could have said, forget y'all and refuse to be the perfect sacrifice for their sins. Instead, he'd go on to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus stayed on task. I mean, what I'm trying to show you is, Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem was more than theological proof of his messianic status it also serves as practical advice on how we should travel while en route to our own Calvary. But Jesus himself said in Matthew 16, 24, if any person, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me, and whosoever will save his life, her life, will lose it, and whosoever will lose their life for my sake will find it. Jesus, as we find him in Scripture, Jesus, as we see him in our mind's eye, Jesus is our, Jesus is your tour guide. And if you want to reach heaven, you got you to gotta follow him. And if you follow Jesus, he will lead you to Calvary because as your, as your tour guide, he'd be negligent not to remind you there will be times when you're abundantly blessed, but don't let it go to your head. And there'll be times when you see your sunny days become tornadic. Those who were crying out, Hosanna. Those who were crying out, Hosanna in the highest, began crying out because they wanted him to save them from the mess that goes along with life. By observing where Jesus went and how he lived as he eased on down, eased on down the road, you get a better sense of what to expect and how to handle the good, the bad, and the ugly in life. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. One, I think that was kind of fresh too. I got one more for you though. It's important to note that Jesus didn't just get on the donkey 
or travel to Jerusalem through the wilderness. Rather, he undoubtedly had to travel on roads and paths that had been followed, that had been made before him. There are times in life when Jesus will lead you down paths that are well-worn or clearly marked. There are times you must travel down more difficult paths that need to be cleared due to infrequent use. And there may be times when you need to be the trailblazer who creates new paths where none existed before. Life is not always a crystal Thank y'all. Somebody help me. It's not always a crystal staircase. So it's always helpful to have an example or know someone who can help you along the way, which is why if you look in your program, you'll see a picture of none other than Shirley Chisholm. Shirley Chisholm. Her election to the New York State Assembly in 1965, though still uncommon, was not unheard of, as other African-American women had previously been elected to that body, meaning her journey to the State Assembly was along a path already marked and manicured by her predecessors and contemporaries. Yet it illustrates to me, it illustrates to me her conviction. Chisholm's road to the U.S. Congress was more challenging than her trip to the state office, for though other black women had run for Congress, none had been elected. Her trek to victory in 68 made Chisholm the first black female elected to the House of Representatives. She reached that office by traveling down a road that had been carved in the soil but was covered over with overgrowth due to its infrequent use. But that trip revealed her commitment. The Congresswoman's run for the office of president for these United States made her the first African American from a major political party to do so, and the first black woman from any party to do so. In other words, she blazed a trail for black women where none existed before. Though Shirley did not get elected, we know that. Her effort revealed her courage to journey where no sister had gone before. Shirley Chisholm was an example. She was an inspiration for many African-American female officials who followed her. And I would argue, even opening the door for our current Vice President of the United States of America, Kamala Harris. And, and let me just deviate from the script a little bit. I mean, if you watched how our Vice President came into office, they had a smear campaign against her as soon as she took that position. Why are you going to put her over the border crisis? And, th and thinks she's going to solve it overnight. And then say she's incompetent because it still exists. It existed before her. It exists now. And it'll continue to exist. In my opinion, I could be wrong. I'm trying to think of previous Vice President Dole. Pence, I mean, do you remember anything they did other than stand there? I would gather to say she is a better vice president. Can I go there? Go ahead. Go ahead. Than our current president was. <laughs> and I guarantee you she'd be a better president than the one running from the Republican Party right now. <laughs> Give me Harris over what's-his-name any day. And you got, 
I mean, we know the bottom line is that, that our current president's having struggles, not, a, not because of what's happening around the world. He's redeveloped relationships with other world leaders. Folks are afraid of having a black president if he says goodbye. That's all that is. Give me Harris over Trump any day of the week. Amen. Shirley Chisholm was a trailblazer whose story continues to inspire and direct the lives of others. It's always good to have an example of a person who can direct you along this life's journey. Jesus' triumphant journey served as an example, served as a roadmap we should all follow in our own brief lives. Indeed, no one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus said. He is the tour guide who will lead you to God and heaven. The journey wasn't easy for him, and it won't be easy for you. Sometimes the road will be smooth with good weather and good Samaritans along the way. Sometimes the road will be filled with potholes and covered with overgrowth of challenging people and circumstances. And sometimes there will be instances when you have to dig a path, create a path, build a road where none existed before. But if you follow the example of Jesus he will not only be with you on the good days and the good roads, he will help you make a way out of no way, even through uncharted territory. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming of the kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. What Susanna mean? Save us. Save us. If you want to be delivered through the storms in your journey, say Hosanna. If you want to be predicted from the haters and robbers along the way, shout Hosanna. If you want to be freed from the shackles and consequences of sin, scream Hosanna. Lord, we are weak. We need thy strength and power to help us through our weakest hour. Let me through the darkness thy face to see. Lead me, O oh Lord. Lead me. Yes. Precious God, there are so many trials and tribulations in life that call our names on a daily basis. Circumstances that seek to break our spirits. Circumstances that seek to make us lose hope. Circumstances that seek to turn us away from you. But I thank you on this Palm Sunday, Lord, that you've given us an example in Jesus of how to deal with the tribulations that come in life. We thank you, God, for his example of how we should live. We thank you, God, for the directions he's given us, not just to Calvary, but to glory after Calvary. We thank you, God, for this Palm Sunday because it shows us again that Jesus is our tour guide. And if we follow him, he will not lead us astray. So my prayer this morning is for each of us, but especially those who've not come to know Jesus in the pardoning of their sins. My prayer is that they would come to Jesus. And then know he'll hold their hands and direct them to the place God created them to reside. We love you, Jesus, for your Holy Spirit. Your Holy Spirit, which 
is like those headphones that keep us in contact with your voice no matter where we go. We thank you, God, for your creative power. We thank you, God, for your saving grace. And on this day, we recommit ourselves to you because you committed yourself through Jesus to us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. And amen. Somebody say Hosanna. Thank you, Jesus. If you're here today, that is the perfect sign that you know something, that you know Jesus, or you're searching for Jesus. If you know him, you're in good shape. Keep following him. Keep listening to him. Keep going where he directs you. If you don't know him, this is the day that you need to give your life to the one who gave his life for you. As everyone who's able rises to their feet, the doors of the church are open. God's arms are open for you. All you got to do is let Jesus lead you. this morning. This is the perfect day to grab on to God's unchanging hand and let him lead you and guide you to the place, to the blessings that he has set aside for you. The doors of the church are open. You got to walk through. He's not going to force you. He's not going to pull you. He's not going to push you. He's just going to open the doors but it's up to you to take that step. We love you, Jesus, because you not only died for us on Calvary's cross, you show us daily by the power of your spirit how we are to live and where we are to go. I pray, God, that if there's anyone in this place who's lost, who's tired, who's confused, that your spirit would help them hear your beckoning call and they respond to your words. The doors of the church are open. God's arms are open. Maybe you know God in the forgiveness and the pardoning of your sins. This is your chance to give your life to Jesus through service in this particular church. A church filled with sinners who are saved by God's amazing grace. Is there one this morning who would heed the call, who would follow the tour guide called Jesus? This is your time. Is there one? Amen. You may be seated. Well, I'm still enough to hope that if no one responded to my call to give their lives to Jesus, my, my hope, my belief, my prayer is that everybody knows Jesus in this space. If you don't, you don't need me to save you. You can accept Jesus wherever you are at any time of the day by inviting him into your heart, by confessing your sins and saying, I love you, Jesus, because I believe you rose from the grave. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you know the power of his pardoning blood, we invite you now to come forward to the altar because that means you also know the power of prayer. Jesus responds to our prayers. All we have to do is utter them verbally or silently, knowing that God hears our every petition. The altar is open for you. We invite you to come down now.
Hosanna. Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. We cry out to you, Jesus. Save us. Save us. And we know that you are the Messiah. We know that you are the King of Kings. We know that you are the one who was prophesied for centuries and we have waited, your people waited centuries for you to arrive. And so as we join in that history and wave our palms to welcome you, Lord, we pray that we might surrender, that we might surrender to your will and to your will. That, Lord God, you would give us the ability to obey you, just like those disciples who went forth, not knowing what kind of response they would get, to untie a coat belonging to someone else. But, Lord, you gave them the boldness. You gave them the courage. You gave them the strength to do that. And when they brought that coat to you, that coat surrendered to you, to your power, to your majesty. Somehow that colt knew that the rider was no ordinary man, but the rider was God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God come to earth to show us what the kingdom is like, to show us how we should live, to show us what it means to surrender to our great God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, Lord God, even as we wave our palms today, we ask you to enable us to be like that colt, to surrender all we are and all we have, all of our gifts, all of our talents, all of our skills, to you, to be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom, Jesus. Oh, you know how we feel. Sometimes we're so hesitant to even admit that we have those gifts you have blessed us with. But Lord, give us the courage to acknowledge the gifts and to let them be used, whatever they are, Lord. Whether they're used to help get people out for this election, whether they're used to stand up against the forces of evil, that are manifesting themselves so strongly right now, whether they are to send help to Haiti, whether those gifts are to help at the border to bring an end to the war in Gaza. Lord, we have gifts. We have skills. Help us surrender them to you. And right here on the home front, Lord, help us to use those gifts to bring peace to our streets and into the violence that so needlessly claims so many lives and into all the hatred that is here even in this very city. Lord, bring us together. Help us to use our gifts to unite each of us to know that we share a common humanity and that you have gifts and plans and goals your kingdom that you can bring to fruition through all of us. Lord, use us and our gifts and graces to bring comfort to those who are sick, to let them know that you are the great physician, and it is by your stripes that they are being healed. Lord, give each one who might be sick today or have a loved one, Lord, let them cry out, Lord, I know that you are my healer and open themselves up to be touched and healed and restored by your power. Lord, let us use our gifts and skills to minister to those who are grieving, who have lost loved ones to death in so many different ways and methods, Lord, today. Lord God, give them comfort and use us. We are your hands, we are your feet, we are the voice that they can hear communicating your love and your care. 
Use each one of us, we pray. And let us welcome Jesus into our hearts, into our souls, into the temple that we dwell in and into this temple called St. Mark United Methodist Church. Lord, we welcome you. We give you the praise. And we cry out, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. has also blessed us financially. He's given us treasure that can be used to build the kingdom, to build up this church, to make this church and our denomination what it aims to be, a force for transforming the world. And so this is your chance now to surrender to the Lord of that treasure to give back to him for the upbuilding of the kingdom some of what he has blessed you with. Give in faith. Give in the true belief that you can make a difference as you give generously and cheerfully. Let us pray. Lord, we do surrender ourselves to you. We surrender our time, our talent, and right now, Lord, we surrender our treasure. Help us to give, oh, with free and open hands, knowing, oh God, that you are the one who multiplies what we give to make a difference in this world, to meet some need, and to draw others into relationship with you. Have your way in our giving, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. 